Okay, you want to go to Sunday school now? Nah, no, you have to go to Sunday school. Okay. Some more songs? Okay, stand with us then. Everybody lift your hand like this. Come on, clap your hand to Jesus.
Amen.
Give him glory. He's the most high God. He's exalted in our midst. Give him glory up above our heads. Hey. One, two, three. You are the most high. You are the most high God. Jehovah. You are the most high God. You are the most high God. You go to Nigeria. You don't know. You are the most high. You are the most high God. We go to Nigeria, Kidogo, amen. And tell him that he's the most high. Now, this is how you do it when you go to Nigeria. You bend Kidogo and do that. Eh? Amen. Has it been good to you? Your neighbor doesn't know your testimony. Only you know where God has brought you from. Amen. He has healed you. He has delivered you. He has saved you. He has protected you. Yeah. He has provided for you. the Lord and he says praise him with a dance yeah. are you ready one more time in the presence of the Lord. He's the one that is pleased with our dance. Our neighbors cannot be pleased with our dance. That's why we do not go out there to dance. But in the presence of the Lord. Where there's fullness of joy. Where there's liberty to dance. Yes. Liberty to shout. Oh, yeah. Liberty to give him glory because he deserves it. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands and bless his name. He's been good to us, good to our family. Hey, we bless your name, Lord. We glorify your name for your great, Lord. Just lift your hands to him and tell him he's great. You are so great, oh God. You are great, oh God. Are you Lord? And you're greatly to be praised. You're greatly to be praised. Oh, yeah. 
For your greatness. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your masses that are new every morning. Church, raise your voices and thank the Lord oh, yes. for the greatness that he has shown Great us this you, morning. Lord. Great you are, Great Jehovah you, King. Lord. You have given us a special yeah, gift of life. Thank you, Lord. Church, may you praise the Lord for all that he has done for us and give him glory and honor this morning. Great is your faithfulness and there is none like you. We choose to stand upon your greatness, yes. Jehovah Lord, yes. for that is the foundation of our being, O oh Lord. Thank you for who you have been. Yes. Have, your, have your way in us this morning, Lord. Thank you for good weather. Thank you for bringing us here, Jehovah King. There is none like you. Church, let us praise the Lord for his goodness. Yes. Let's raise our hands and give a shout of praise to him. As we say, great is your faithfulness, Lord. You are gracious, Master. There is none like you. We glorify your name, my Father and my King. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Church, good morning and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Church. Are we happy to be here this morning? It started as a chilly morning. But uh, a young man stood here and he raised our fires. Are you happy? Did you feel the heat or it's only I who warmed up when this young man was singing here and telling us to stand on the promises of God? 
Are we standing on those promises this morning? Are we deciding? Are we, are we just thinking about it? Let us stand on the promises of God because great is his righteousness. Amen? My name is Susan Soy, and I love the Lord. He is my Savior. I'm a member of the missions board, and I love serving in that capacity. Not because I am so good at it, not because I was born for it, not because I went to school and learned about it, but the Lord helps me every day to do that. And uh, when we started this month, Pastor uh, Reverend Julius told us to drop our pots and run and say, come see a man. How many of us have dropped our pots and are coming to see, uh, saying, come see a man? If you haven't dropped your pot, what are you waiting for? The month to be told about dropping pots is over. Now drop the pot. Are we dropping the pot? Church, are we dropping that pot? The pot of tiredness, laziness, disobedience, killer kitu that tells you, no, you cannot go, you cannot talk to people. Are we dropping those pots? Please do. And join the missions. Because you are born a missioner. You are created to make God's work easier for all of us. Amen? Amen. Drop the pot, drop the pot, and say, come see a man. Amen? Amen? Now, this month, we've been told a lot about dropping pots, about how to, where to go, what is expected of us. We were told last week, and now I invite my brother, Ishmael Macharia, one of the members of the board with me, and many others who serve in that capacity to come and tell us more about dropping the pot, where to drop it, and how to go about it. Karibu Ishmael. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we can have our seats. Um, and I'm receiving some showers of blessings here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> yes, so this has been Missions Month. My name is Ishmael. Uh, like Susan has said, I am born again, and I'm married to Diana. And uh, the Lord has uh, blessed us with three children. And it's great. This is always, November is always one of the most exciting times for me as we get to reflect and to learn about missions because I love missions. Buona asifiwe. And I don't know how it has been for you, but we've been told, like Susan has said, we've learned a lot, haven't we? Haven't we? And I believe that each one of us have had a moment, either, you know, just to reflect, either ulikuwa, you know, you're just getting bored, you're thinking, what are these people telling us? You know, everyday missions, missions. Or you're, you're getting that moment of reflection of like, yeah, I think I need to get involved. But I know each one of us have been uh, thinking and praying, and I know most of, our, uh, most of us have seen the opportunities to do missions, and maybe you have your list, and you're saying, this is how I'm going to implement. And I know if you're like me, you've also wondered. So we are being called to do missions. We are being told we are all missionaries. And you've wondered, how do I go about this? So do I drop the pot? Do I put it down? Do I put it on the side? And I want us to spend the next few minutes just learning practical ways on how we can tell people come see a man okay and we are running with the, our theme for this month has been come see a man but we're also saying one every day that's our rallying call for the next one year as a church let's pray lord we thank you and we worship you thank you lord always for an opportunity to come and sit before you and learn from you father i want to lift our hearts god all of us to you i want you we, I want to pray, God, that you bring down every stronghold, anything, God, that might hinder us from listening and obeying, and anything that might bring fear or pride or doubt, Lord, in us. God, we, we lay ourselves bare to you, God. Come and speak. Let your word come and penetrate even to, to the dividing lines of our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Buona sifiwe. So I want us to spend the next few minutes just learning a concept that is called relational evangelism. And that will be our
On the missions board, I'm talking about all of us. We are the church. Tell your neighbor, you are the church. And so as a church, we would like to move forward and implement this strategy. And so the topic of our sermon today, if you're writing, is relational evangelism. And I'm going to start with definition as usual. And I'm going to loosely define relational evangelism as taking the advantage of our daily relationships and interactions to systematically and spontaneously share the love of God. You know, you have a plan or you just decided to exploit a relationship that just formed or an interaction or an opportunity could be spontaneous. And so as we focus on reaching the city, and I believe that all of us know that we are focusing on the city. We are coming back, we said, let's go back to our Jerusalem and let's focus on our Jerusalem. And Paul speaking to the church in Rome, in the book of Romans 10, verse 13 and 14. So he tells this church, for everyone who calls on the, on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, I, I know these are words that resonate. You know, those annoying neighbors, you think, wow, well, if only this person will be saved. You know, when you're out in a matatu and you're thinking, if only this, 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 this conductor would be saved. You know, when you look at our politicians and you're thinking, if only these people would know God. And Paul is saying that anyone, those people can actually get born again. Can you see all the problems when we're looking at our children, our teenagers, and we're seeing all these statistics? You know, so many pregnancies. You know, pregnancy, let's talk about girls, even the, even the boys, yeah? Focused on the girls, even the boys that made these girls pregnant. And you're thinking, wow, what's the solution? And Paul is Paul saying that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he poses a question and he asks, how then will they call on whom? They have not believed. And, and then, then he said, how are they to believe in whom they have, not, they have never heard? And, and then he continues, and how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? So if you are looking at the world that we are living in, and you're saying, we want solutions. There are a lot of things that need to change. These people need to be saved. They need to know God. And we need to tell them they cannot. No. And so this church... The Roman church was in a city, just like our church, and we can draw a lot of parallel. And if, for those people who love history and you read history, during this time when these scriptures were written in the first century, the Roman city was plagued with a lot of problems. And we look at the Roman city, we see a city, a city that was very immoral, a city that politically, you know, it was doing so badly, just like our city. It was a city that was going through a lot of economic immorality, just like our city. And Paul writes to this church saying that he desires that people should be born again. And I keep on saying one of the biggest advantage we have as ICC Mara is our position in this city. It's our position. Just look at where God has put this church. A lot of people who are influential in this city, the people who go, and, and, and if you want to know, just, just go to the train station in the morning and you have a lot of people going there and they're going all over and they're spreading themselves all over this city to influence what happens in this city and god has placed us here and we can influence this city just by the location of our church if you look at the estates around us you look at the industries around us and we need to continually reflect as a church and ask ourselves how are we taking advantage of this location that we are in and more to that as disciples of christ we must be like him. And we define a disciple of Christ as someone who is like Jesus in his character, in his conduct, and his, in his commitment. And we need to keep on evaluating ourselves and asking ourselves. I call myself, today if I ask people, lift your hand if you think you're a disciple of Christ. I know most of us, if not all of us, we lift our hands. So we need to examine and ask ourselves, how can I really prove that I'm a disciple of Christ? You can only prove that you're a disciple of Christ if when you evaluate your character, it's like Christ or if it's growing to be like Christ. And what was the character of Christ? It was a character of compassion. Christ was very compassionate. If you read the book of Matthew 9, where it says, you know, and he looked, he looked at the Jews, he looked at Israel, and his heart was moved by compassion. He felt sad for these people, because the word of God says that they looked like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. As a Christian, what is the character of your heart? What moves you when you see the evil around you? What moves you when you see people around you? Yesterday in my neighborhood, there was a party. The birthday party. And there were all oh, these guys. It was a birthday party for a 12-year-old. And man, the alcohol that was flowing 
in that birthday party and they are all these kids and I'm asking, why will make this kid not drink? If you're happy, if you want to celebrate, what do you do? You pour a lot of alcohol when you see people like that. And those guys made noise for us the whole night. And you're thinking, wow, you're so mad. What comes into your heart? What would Jesus do? Jesus would be moved by compassion. When we are walking around the estate and you're looking at our teenagers and the things they are doing when they are, you know, they're taking drugs and, and, and when, when, when they are immoral and you're looking at them at night hanging around, you know, hanging out with each other and doing all these things. What comes into your heart? Is it condemnation or is your heart like the heart of Christ? When you look at our politicians, are you feeling like those guys, I think it's in Ukraine, who put their politicians in the dustbin. Are you feeling, and, and, and you know, I, I must confess, sometimes I get so mad. And, and you know, sometimes I think I feel like I want to become a terrorist. You know, I just go bomb these people. Please, is your heart like that or is your heart saying, wow, I just wish these people would know God. We must have a character like that of Christ. What is our commitment? What is the commitment of Christ? Christ said that I came to the world not to condemn it, but to save it so that the lost must see the light. And we must evaluate ourselves as Christians. And so, like Nicodemus, we must ask ourselves, what must I do? Ask yourself that. What must I do? No, ask now, not when you go home. Now, ask yourself, what must I do? Yeah, we must. We must because there are opportunities and there's a reason why we need to go out there. And so we must ask ourselves, what must I do? And I know that you're asking yourself that question and you've been asking yourself that question and the Lord today has an answer for you. And I want us to look at the story of the Samaritan woman. That has been our anchor scripture where we got our theme of let uh, come see a man. And um, let's turn our Bibles to the book of uh, John chapter 4 where that story is. So John chapter 4, I'm going to read from verse 25. The word of God says, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I have ever done, all that I ever did. Can this be Christ. They went out of town and were coming to him. And theologians have turned this woman as the first missionary. And I want us just to learn five lessons. Five lessons. Even as we prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for action in relational evangelism. What can we learn from the Samaritan woman? Because I can tell you she, she, she's a very good example. She practically did relational evangel uh, evangelism. And by the way, if you look and if you know the story of the Samaritan woman, she was the most unqualified. I was telling the first service if today we were going for a mission and we told people to sign up and if the Samaritan woman was leaving during our time and we all know and then she signed up, I am very sure maybe the, 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 the pastor in charge of missions, you know, might, you know, maybe pull her aside and tell her, are you, are you really sure you want to go? You know, are, are you sure? You know, you might... Maybe you wanted to, to sign up for Captivate class and this is the, uh, the, the mission's uh, sheet. She was the most unqualified. And I'm imagining she had a bad reputation. You know, she's the one, if she passes by your house and waves at your husband, you know, you, you pull your husband back in the house, you know. She was, you know, she was the least qualified. But she still went out there and a whole city, a whole city had about Christ. What about me and you? We don't have a bad reputation. What about me and you? What excuse do we have? The first lesson that you can learn from the Samaritan woman is that as Christians, we, have, we must have genuine love for the unbelievers. And this shouldn't be hard for us in church, should it be? Because we all learned since the time of Sunday school that the greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I know we've sung... You know, I know we focus and we all know this. So having genuine love for unbelievers should not be very hard for us. When I look at the Samaritan woman, she demonstrated genuine love. 
for the unbelievers. And I thank the worship team because they told us, you know, let's, let's dance like the Nigerians when we think about how good God is. The Samaritan, I'm not saying it's bad to dance, but the Samaritan woman did not decide, I'm going to dance because to see the Lord. But she thought about these that have received, others should also receive. It's genuine love. You know, she thought in my village, my village, my, my, my town, my city, sorry, needs Jesus. She had genuine love for those people. And by the way, those people might not even have liked her a lot. She was going to the well at midday when everybody had gone in the morning. She was living in isolation. So I'm not very sure those people really loved her. But she had genuine love for these people. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? If most of us here in Nairobi today, you're walking and you're going to work and you meet this guy and you really know this is the Messiah. You know, I don't know what the evidence or the threshold would be. And you really know. I'm very in Nairobi. Most of us will not even want to say, we will keep quiet and maybe open a museum to come and see. You know, we, we are thinking how we can, you know, cash in in this situation. But for her, she thought about the lost people. The second lesson that we can learn from the Samaritan woman is obedience. In the book of First Corinthians uh, chapter 2, it says that we who have the spirit of God, we have what? The mind of God. And many, many times, because the spirit of God is always speaking to us. When we turn to the right, when we turn to the left, he's always speaking. Even when we are sinning, he's always telling us, this is a sin. The spirit of God is always speaking. And I know most of us, all of us, if you are a believer, one of the things that God wants or many times in your life that the spirit of God has told you is to prompt you to share the gospel with someone. You know, God, the spirit of God is nudging you, you know, share. Share the love of God. Share your testimony with this person. And it happened to me one time when I was coming home and I was so tired. There were no matatus. I'd walked from Malingam to town to the train station. So I sat there on that bench waiting for the train to come and I was feeling so tired. You know, those days you just want to mind your own business. You don't want to talk to, just want to get home, not even talk to the kids. At the time you, you know, your kids are coming under your feet because you don't even know you're going over them because you don't want to talk to them. You don't even want to talk to your wife. That day, that's how I was feeling. Then this guy comes and sits next to me in the bench, on the bench. And then I feel the spirit of God, God telling me, share the gospel with him. So I had a small booklet called the Four Spiritual Laws in my pocket. Some of you know it. And I felt, oh no, no, God, I don't, want, I don't even want to talk. You know, I don't want to talk. And I really felt the, the spirit of God really pushing me, share the gospel with this guy. I even moved from that bench and I went sat somewhere else. And then the train came and I got into the train and guess what? The same guy came and sat next to me. I'm feeling God is share the gospel with this guy. And I'm saying, God, no. I even picked a newspaper. You know, in the train, there are those people, newspapers. I picked one and I started reading. Then before the train left, this very young girl came, maybe college age. She came and sat next to the guy. And immediately she sat next to the guy. She started sharing the gospel with this guy. Oh, and I was so ashamed. And I put down my newspaper and I joined in the conversation. I hijacked <laughs> someone's conversation. And I know most of us have had and found ourselves in this situation. But you know what? The Samaritan woman, and I can tell you, this was not flesh and blood. It was not a, you know, she, she was the least. She was the least religious of all. But when she heard and the Spirit of God nudged her, she dropped her pot and she ran. We cannot continue to walk in disobedience. Number three, the last lesson that we can learn is that relational evangelism happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts 1, 8, Christ speaking to the disciples, he tells them, don't leave Jerusalem. Then he tells them, goes out and he tells them, that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to, until the ends of the earth. That's one, Acts 1, 8. Until the ends of the earth. And we see this because we all know the story of Pentecost. And we see some, a guy like Peter. And I think Peter would represent most of us. The guy who was a coward to the core. You know, this is the same guy who denied Jesus at the high priest's house. He said, no, me, I don't know that guy. Ah, no, no, no. I don't, I've never even seen me. Look at me. And the guy took off. And the guy went back to fishing, by the way, if you know the story of Peter. And it's not like he didn't love God. Peter was one of the guys who really loved Jesus. He, he, across the Gospels, you see. 
But this guy was so, so fearful. Like most of us, like I was in that train. But when the Holy Spirit come, came upon Peter, he's a guy who stood and risked all. By the way, in that time that Peter stood in Jerusalem, it was a risky. Everybody, it was, it was a religious, you know, time. Guys had come to celebrate Passover. So all this, everybody who knew the law and that this guy could have been stoned for blasphemy. He comes here and talks about Jesus who had just died some few weeks before. But when the spirit came and the spirit of God made him bold and the guy st stands up and we all know the results, 3,000 came to the gospel. To hear. Have you given the Holy Spirit a chance in your life? Are you letting him fill your life and empower you and give you the boldness? Because most of us, we really have compassion for the lost, but we don't have the courage to speak to the lost. It's only the Spirit of God that can give us that boldness. And do you know something else that happened during Pentecost? Is that the Word of God records that everybody had this guy speaking in their own language. The Spirit of God gives you an opportunity. It gives you the power to share the, go the gospel in a relevant way. You know, you don't have to be like Reverend Julius. You don't have to be like anyone. You don't have to be like, Rev uh, um, like Reverend Bovey. You don't have to be like Deacon Benson for you to be able to share. But the Spirit of God helps you in, in your context to share the gospel even in the simplest of ways. Number four is that the results belong to God. Simply do your part. I'm imagining the Samaritan woman running back to the city. This is a city that probably didn't love her. This is a city probably that were not going to listen to her because of her reputation. But anyway, she said, I'm going to go and tell these people. And my message will be very simple. Come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. And that's what she did. And most of us are not sharing the gospel because we are holding back, thinking, are they going to believe? You know, some of us are so scared of rejection. We are not going to go there. But she went there because our duty is simply to share and to call people, come see a man in the simplest way. And sometimes we, you know, we just go with our lives there and share with our lives and our testimonies. We just need to simply go there and then leave the results to God. You know, sometimes I've, I've gone for missions and we've gone out there for out door to door and then in the evening we are gathering and people are giving the experiences. People will give the way they were given Uji in this homestead. The way some people come back carrying sugarcane. You know, others were chased by a panga. And then you can see the moderator, you know, no soul came to Christ and everybody is so disappointed. There's no need of disappointing. Being disappointed, the Lord just sends out there to take the gospel. And then, in due time, he will bring in the harvest. And sometimes it's instant. Sometimes 3,000 people will come to Christ. Remember Paul uh, before Festus and he really shared the gospel, but Festus never uh, did not give his life to Christ. But I know the Lord convicted him and in due time he brought in have it. So don't be afraid whether they're going to get born again. Don't be afraid whether they're going to reject you. Just say, come see a man. The final lesson is reflecting on, our, on the goodness of the Lord. Relationship is two-way. You interact with those people, they interact with your life. And when we don't reflect on what God has done in our own lives, we will have nothing to share. We will, not, we will not have anything to share. When the Samaritan woman interacted with Jesus and Jesus impacted her life, she did not go say, come and see a man who may be telling, you know, come and see a fortune teller who will tell you about your past and your future. No, she spoke her story and she said, come and see a man who has done this for me. She reflected the fact that Christ had impacted her life that's what compelled her to run. What has God done in your life? The psalmist in Psalm 16 writes and says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? And then he answers himself and he says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. And in our case, just like in the case of the Samaritan woman, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? We should answer ourselves and say, I will run to my neighbors. I will run to my relatives. I will run to my schoolmates. I will run to the students that I teach. 
I will run to my workmates. I will run to the gate man who opens my gate. I will run to the house, to the girl who helps me in my house. And I will tell them of the goodness of the Lord. When we reflect on what God has done in our life, we are compelled not to keep quiet. We don't want to keep quiet. Have you seen that advert of um, an old lady winning, I think it's one of those ponyokan or something, ponyokan or something uh, competitions. And she wins and she jumps in a, in a marketplace and she wants everybody to know. Eh? I think that's what she says. You know, I have won. How much as Christians should we jump and say, you know, come and see what the Lord has done. Come and see a man who has blessed me. Come and see a man who has healed me. Come and see, see a man who has given me a beautiful family. Come and see a man who has given me a job. More than just coming and dancing in church. We should go out there and jump. So having prepared ourselves to go out there and having armed our hearts and our minds and our bodies, I want to teach you two very simple, practical ways that you can actually go out there and share the gospel. And the first concept or the first model is what is called conversational evangelism. And conversational evangelism is simply taking advantage of situations around you to start gospel conversation. So you could be seated in traffic and the Lord is telling you to share the gospel with the other person next to you and you're wondering, oh my God, how am I going to break this ice? Okay? And you're looking out and you tell them, hey, na in Nairobi kona watu hengi, you know, just that line can carry a conversation the whole day. You know, and you can now build up and hey, yes, and he'll agree definitely. Hey, yes, in Nairobi kona watu hengi sana. And then you could even say something like, you know, I can you imagine God knows all these people by their name? Do you believe God knows your name? And that could easily start a conversation. And one time I found myself in that situation. So I got into a bus in town. And this lady comes and sits next to me. She was a Muslim. She was in her bui bui. And I'm telling God, I love Muslims, by the way. And I'm telling God, God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with this lady. But I'm also fearful. Because I've had stories, you know, Muslim ladies, they don't talk to men, you know. They don't do all this. You know, I was even uncomfortable. She sat next to me. So I'm wondering, what is she thinking about this dude sitting next to her? And I told God, God, I need this opportunity. And, and I saw her wiping sweat off her face and I could see she's getting so I told, So, Pastor, can I, can I open the window for you? You look like you're, you know, you're feeling very hot. And she said, yes, yes, yes. And then she told me, by the way, you know, and, and it's good to pray. She actually started the conversation herself. And she said, you know, I don't even like wearing these things. You know, I even wear these things for my father. Ah, perfect opportunity. <laughs> God, don't say, yes, you know, as, hey, so I, I told her, you know, I, I thought in, 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 you know, in Islam, I can see a Muslim, I thought it's a must to wear this thing. No, 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 me, I'm not even religious. No, it's my father, you know, if I don't wear this thing. So, you know, as Christians, you know, as we don't even, we don't tell people to wear anything. And I got an opportunity to share. And between town and we were in traffic, I really, we talked, you talked about Islam, Christianity. Of course, I got an opportunity to share the gospel. By the time I was alighting, well, she had not given her life to Christ, but I did my part. I told her, come see a man, relational evangelism. You know, if you're seated in a barber shop or in the salon and your salonist or your barber is making your hair, you could start. Well, it might not work. I don't have, I barely have any hair. So you could say, you know, you know the Bible says that the Lord knows can number the hairs on our head. And as he looks at you, you know, I've been plating your hair, I can number them. Yes, that's how God, that's how great God is. Conversational evangelism. I was telling the, uh, I was telling those guys who came here on Wednesday the other day. I was listening to a conversation between my two sons. So my small boy, three years, is uh, asking my seven-year-old. So Taj, how how big is God? And so the seven-year-old, in his own words, the way he understands how big God is, explains. Then my three-year-old reflects, keeps quiet, reflects, and then asks my son, "Can God lift Daddy?" <laughs> Not to him, the biggest giant in his life is Daddy, you know. Well, I don't, I don't even look like a giant. But, yes. And, 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 and you know, that's a perfect opportunity to share the gospel. My, my son, the way my son came to Christ, we were driving along Langata Road. And there was an accident. There had just an, an accident had just happened. This Bodaga had just been hit by a car. 
Chastened and he was lying dead on the road. So we are just passing and that really disturbed my son. Then he asked me, who hit him? So what will happen to him? Then I started telling him, you know the way this guy will get arrested, be taken to court. Wow. You know children, now I have brought this concept of court. It's so difficult for him. Then judge, you know, he'll appear before a judge. And then I saw an opportunity and I told about him, about God and the way God will judge us. And then he keeps quiet. Tell me I don't want to go. You know, I told him God will judge and those people who do bad things will go to hell. And those people who do good things. And then my son keeps quiet and tells him, I don't want to go to hell. You know, when I go before God, I want to be among the people he sends to heaven. Then I told him, for you, you know, you must well come into his heart. And in that car, we prayed and he received Christ. It's called conversational evangelism. Taking advantage of every small situation to share the gospel. One time, I used to do ministry at the University of Nairobi. This day, I was just doing my round. So we would just go knock doors, you know, knock doors. And this day, I had just knocked several doors at a, at a hostel, a boys' hostel called Prefabs. And I was on my way out. But this boy passes me with a, with a white box. He passes me and I felt the spirit of God. Again, the spirit is always speaking to us. I felt the spirit of God telling me, follow him. So I followed him and as he got into his room, I also knocked. So there was this other boy sleeping on the bed. And the other boy, you know, he told him, I got the things, I got the things. So the other boy stood up, excited. So and I got in, I had to break the conversation. So And I did it very badly because I asked the boys, are you guys doing drugs? <laughs> It's a, very, it's a very bad way of uh, starting a gospel conversation. Are you guys doing drugs? Then the guy told me, no, 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 no. These are condoms. Okay. So, by the this is the first, so we, would, we, we used to call them orientation week. So, during the orientation week is the week that first years report. So, they are very green. So, this guy has been in school for three days only. And he found a place to get condoms. The guy comes from Kisumu. By the this is his first time in the city. So, the guy has an agenda. So I sit down and I joked about it. We joked about the condoms. I sat down. I asked, can I come in? And we talked about those condoms for one hour. So we argued about life, about girls. You know, told them about my experience. You know, told them, you know, now 200. You know, how many girls are you planning? You know, hey, told me as many as possible. Well, it was a conversation with young people. Yeah, that's what I do every day. But after one hour of speaking about the condoms, yeah, the, the two boys gave their lives to Christ. And they gave me the condoms. <laughs> I destroyed them, by the way. <laughs> and, and if you want to see the evidence, I even took a video as I destroyed them. Just in case. You know, <laughs> just in case 20 years from now, someone brings up that story. And something even better happened. So what we do is we go and do follow-up. We do follow-up. We tell them, you know, would you like to know more? Can I come and see you next week? And the guys gave me, the two guys gave me a date for next week. And when I came next week to come and See them. I didn't find two guys. I found six guys in the room. So they're waiting for me. So I'm wondering, hey, okay, so what's happened? So this guy tells me, let me tell you. You know, after we talked last week, he told me some very nice thing. And I've been reading my Bible. And I thought my friends should also hear. And I was there and I shared the gospel. And all the other guys gave their lives to Christ. And I walked with those boys for two semesters. And it's so nice that this guy is called Kevin. And Kevin grew in his walk with Christ. Can you see? The devil had a plan for him. Hit campus like that, immorality. But God also had a plan for him. The only thing that he needed is someone, someone to come and tell him. And God put me at the right time. For me, that day I knew my work was over. I was going home. But God told me, no. I think that day no one even had given their life to Christ. But God told me, I brought you here for this guy. Conversational evangelism. So the other concept is called pray, care, share. It's a concept that was um, devised by Campus Crusade for Christ. And pray, care, share is a three very simple step way of sharing Christ. And so you start by prayer. And the way you start by prayer is by praying for God to open an opportunity for you to share the gospel with someone. Okay? Remember, during the one everyday week, we were given some cards. That's how pray, care, share works. That you pray, God, give me someone or some people that I can share the gospel with. And you write the people that the Lord gives you in your heart. Could be your neighbor. Could be your house help. Could be your husband who's not born again. It could be anybody. It could be your baba, your, your doctor, you know, the makanga. It could be anybody. And you put, and this works when you are, you know, when you are close contact and, and um, consistent contact with someone. And you pray. And you go to them. And if there's one 
line that works for everybody across religions, Christianity, Buddhism, is I will pray for you. Everybody is also always praying for everybody. Even the, the people who don't pray, when you tell them I am in trouble, even the ones who don't even know how to pray, they will tell you I'll pray for you. But do you know for us Christians, it's just not another line that everybody says. The word of God says that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That when you commit to pray, God will actually move. God will move. Remember the encounter at Mount Carmel for Elijah. Elijah prayed and God did not disappoint. So every time we commit to pray, God always comes. So recently we've moved to a neighborhood. In our neighborhood, we have a lot of Muslim. And my next, next, next door neighbor is a Muslim. And so as my wife and I were moving, we always pray that everywhere we go, we get an opportunity to do ministry. So we prayed and we told God, God, this new place we're going, give us an opportunity to do ministry. And the first time when we went to see the house, we were just moving around the compound. So our um, compound, there's only a chain link between you and the neighbor. So anyway, you have to talk to your neighbor because you're so close and you see each other. It's, it's, an, open, it's an open neighborhood. So these two boys, the two boys of the house, they're Muslim, small kids, you know, says out to us, says, ah, no, welcome to our neighborhood. In, in case you need anything, you know, just tell us. So we start a, a relationship there. So the next time when we went to prepare the house to move in, the cowboy came and, hey, good to see you again. So he's telling me, out of nowhere, remember we prayed for God to give us an opportunity? Out of nowhere, he starts telling me about his dad. You know, my dad, you know, fell. Uh, he gave me, you know, some time. He's, uh, he's in hospital right now. So I told him, I'm going to pray going to pray. Perfect opportunity. And of course, we committed and we committed and we continued to pray for that man as a family. And we prayed. And then the next time when we moved in, I meet the lady of the house, the wife, to this. So she says hi to me. I say hi back. I said, oh, I heard about him there. I'm very sorry. And I'm going to pray. I told her, I'm a pastor. I said, oh yes, thank you so much. Please pray and pray and pray a lot. He's a Muslim. Everybody needs prayers. So I'm going to pray. And every time I meet her, I remind her that I'm still praying. And so, we sat and we'll be talking, and every time we talk, I ask, how is Muse? And that becomes the center of our conversation. And we become very good friends. So this week, I was just out in my compound repairing my, my son's bike. And this, the, the mother, the, this an old lady, she came out of the door. She was looking for the gardener. And the gardener was nowhere. I was there. And so she asked me, have you seen the gardener? And she really seemed like she really wanted the gardener to do something. So I asked her, is, is, is that something that I can help you with? Okay? So the next step in prayer care share is care. So when you pray, you pray for these people, but you also pray for an opportunity to show care. And so the woman tells me, yes, you know we need to lift Mze from the bed. And by then I'd been praying and saying, I need to pray for this man. I need to lay my hands on this guy. But you know I can't walk into someone's house, knock. I am here to lay his, my hands on him, you know. <laughs> I may just get kicked out. And the Lord opens an opportunity. So I go there and as we lift them Mze from bed, he needed to go somewhere, I am praying for him. And they were so excited that I would do that. They would not call any other neighbor. They know the only person who will not say is the gardener. The gardener will not say no. He has no choice. But here is a neighbor who offered to come and lift. And they felt so cared for. That yesterday, when I was passing there, they were having tea. And said, hey, come and have tea with us. Relationship. Okay? And I'm forming that relationship. I think most of us, two years ago, can remember a story of a guy called Harish. So Harish was an Indian guy at Aga Khan. So that time we were doing hospital ministry and we went. So me and two young men from the youth church went and we, we met with Harish. And Harish was not a believer. He was a Hindu. He had never been to church. And we asked him, can we pray for you? But of course he's lying there and he was very sick. He said yes. And after prayer we started a conversation that went and he, he started talking about, you know, I know Christianity but I've never gone to church. And eventually you know, he said, I know you guys have a Bible. Do you think you could give me a Bible? And we gave him a Bible. And I think Susan went there sometime and found Harish's wife. He's also an Indian, reading the Bible. He couldn't read. He was very, very sick. Couldn't read the Bible. And she read, and she would go there and start reading the Bible. And she read the Bible to herself, and she gave her life to Christ. So Harish went to be with the Lord, but the lady and her daughter came to know Christ from a very simple conversation of, can I pray for you? That's how powerful that conversation is. And eventually, finally, is the last step in that is sharing. Because when you care for people so deeply, in a world where everybody is self-centered, in a world where neighbors don't to, to talk to each other, you know, in a world where someone will pass you and splash you water when it's raining, they will not think to stop and ask you, you know, can you come into my car? Where are you going? In a world like that, when you start to show care for people, they'll wonder, what kind of a person is this? And eventually, they'll bring it up. Why are you so nice? And you know, most of us, when now we come that we want to shine, I'm there too, it's my weakness. Please don't tell them. <laughs> No, 
You know, a lot of times when you, when you compliment people that, yeah, you're looking good, it's my weakness. You know, you're like, no, 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 no. Please don't say it's my weakness. Say it is the Lord. It is a lot. Don't say nakuanga evil. No, 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 no. Take advantage of that to share your story. And even tell them, you know what? Sometime, uh, this, sometime back I was never like this until I met this man. You know, come and see this man. Do you know, would, would you like to know much more about this man? Okay, don't shine. Let the Lord shine. And when you tell your story, remember the lesson we said about reflecting on the goodness of the Lord? When you reflect on the goodness of the Lord, you get a testimony that you can go sharing to every other person. Have you met those people who are so bubbly and so happy to tell you what the Lord has done in their life? I have a friend like that. He's called Nancy. And Nancy is an American. She's very old, a very old lady. And when you take her out, she'll not even eat because she was walking to the basin to wash hands and then she meets someone there. She'll talk about the goodness of the Lord. She will go. She will meet with the, with the waiter. She'll talk the moon. One time by there we went, and I'm not joking. One time we went with her at Capital Center and we were looking for We couldn't. She was in the kitchen sharing with the chef about the goodness of the Lord. You know, I wish all of us would be so excited to share our stories and God's story. Are you ready to go and share? Do you feel that you're well equipped? Let us close our eyes. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, not just to be loved by you, but, Father God, to speak about your love to other people. And Lord God, we are so grateful that you can give us an opportunity this year, this month, Lord, this year, to share with one person every day. That you give us an opportunity and the courage and the boldness to practice conversational evangelism and to practice pray. Just telling, Lord, I surrender myself to you. Use me as a vessel. I don't know how to start. I don't know how to talk. But Lord, let your spirit, just like you did with Peter, come and guide me so that I can share your love with others. And if you're there and you're not born again, that's where it all starts. I want to invite you to come and see this man, Jesus. The man who can bring so much joy and so much transformation, so much comfort and so much satisfaction in your life. Are you there and you're not born again and you're saying, I want to receive this man. I want to meet this man so that I can tell others about him. Just lift your hand and I'll see it wherever you are. I'm going to pray with you. There you're not born again and you say, I want to give my life to Christ this morning. Are you there? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, Father God, we pray, Jehovah God, that as you dismiss us today into our homes, walk with us and give us the courage. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you so much, and I hope you're going to practice. And next year, the missions board will be organizing trainings on prayer care share. So don't worry. Today was just a sneak preview. We will get, it's a long, long training, and we'll all get prepared. God bless you. Thank you very much, Brother Ishmael. Let's appreciate him even more. Because uh, now we have been fully armed. We know what to do, but we drop the pot. We don't just drop the pot and stand there. We have even been told how to do the sharing. So I'm sure all of us now are convicted. And because we are all convicted, at the uh, info desk is a uh, desk where you can sign up to share, I mean, to serve in any one of our four ministries. You can share, I mean, you can sign up for the hospital ministry, go and find the Harishes that uh, Ishmael found. You can go for the uh, outreach ministry. You can sign in for prisons, or you can sign in for the school's ministry. That's a whole range of our daily routines that we, on the people we interact with. That besides, we always meet people. Even in our houses, there are those who are not born again, who don't know Christ. 
there are those who look at us from afar and wonder why you're glowing. It is because of the Lord. So we can share with all those. Thank you very much. Can we have the, fam uh, before the family news, do we have any guests with us? First time visitors? Kindly stand up so that we can all see and appreciate your presence with us because we love visitors. Thank you very much. We have a good number of them. Uh, keep standing until the, our protocol team hands in a gift to you. And after this, please don't be in a hurry to leave. We love visitors. We want to interact with you, tell you more about ICC, what we are all about, and what you also are about. And uh, at the back of the, of the, of the tent, there is a, a desk there that will be guided to where you'll be met by the protocol team. Thank you very much. If you are leaving us, if you are just visiting, come back again. But when you go, take your greetings and our love to your people. If you need a place to worship, you're in the right place. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Family News. Hello, ICC. Welcome to this Sunday service. It's nice to see you here today. A very warm welcome to all our visitors. Here at ICC Imara, we have two Sunday services, the first service at 8.30 a.m. and the second service at 10.30 a.m. We also have our teens and next-gen services that run concurrently with these two services at the Connection Center. And for our youth service, which is the iPhone channels, also happens at the Connection Center from 10.30 a.m. Our midweek service runs every Wednesday from 6 p.m. My name is Jessica Nkasa, and this is Family News. To all our born-again Christians who haven't been baptized, we will have an opportunity for baptism on the 2nd of December, which is our Celebration Sunday. So please pass by the information desk, fill in the forms, and leave them there. The I-Men will be having an end-of-year Thanksgiving breakfast on Saturday, the 1st of December, from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. at the Connection Center. Come, let's celebrate what the Lord has done in 2018. The iFront channels will be having a car wash on the 2nd of December. This will be to raise funds for the annual front runners camp. So please let them wash your car. We have something exciting for the teens and the next gen. The teens camp is happening this coming week from 28th of November to the 1st of December. They will be headed to Ukunda Diani and the next gen camp to the Mwana Resource Center at Ukunda Diani from the 11th to the 15th of December. The total cost for the next gen camp is 11,000 shillings while the teens camp is 13,000 shillings. Kindly note that the deadline for payment is today. For more information, visit the information desk. That's it from me and the media team. Do have yourselves a blessed week. Bye. Thank you very much, media team. Uh, Ashes, kindly take your positions. And be prepared to give to the Lord. Let us pray for the offering. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for your promises, Jehovah King. Thank you for the goodness that you have shown us. Thank you for your protection, even in the times we did not know you. We thank you, Father, for who you have been. Thank you for your provisions, Jehovah Lord. And now it's an opportunity for us to give back to you, O oh God, as you say that we shall not come to your house bare handed, O oh Jehovah God. Yet you know, Lord, and you are good, you can know there are those who do not have. Master, may you bless them with your, with, your, with your own provision. And those who are forgiving today, Lord, continue blessing us, Father. Bless the work of our hands, O Jehovah, Lord, even as we give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray.
them again. Thank you very much, James, and your team. God bless you so much.
Thank you very much for listening, for being here, for being encouraged, for being convicted, and for signing up. Pastor G uh, Julius. It is good to be convicted. It is good to listen. But you must do something with the conviction. Hallelujah. I don't intend to preach another sermon, but I want to share with you one scripture that the Lord uses in me and has continually reminded me of the whole of John chapter 3 it has the story of Nicodemus and it has the story of the testimony of John the Baptist about Jesus Christ and the last verse of chapter 3 of John verse number 36 says whoever believes in the son has eternal life but whoever rejects the son will not see life. For God's wrath remains in him. Praise God. And I want to share this verse as a verse that we shall think throughout the week. For those of us who have not heeded to the call that was made here to come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And to those of us who are born again believers and who are compelled by the Spirit of God to share the gospel with whoever we come across, taking opportunities that God gives us daily. And this is the entire gospel from Genesis to Revelation that whoever believes in the son has eternal life. And you believe, <clears throat> you believe in the son of God, you have eternal life. You have rejected the son, you will not see life. And the reason why I'm sharing this with us, particularly for those of us who are believers, how many people do you come across that probably you never have eternal life because they never heard the gospel? And you knew the gospel, all the gospel. And I keep asking myself, what will happen when we go to heaven? Will God perhaps ask us to stand and see how many people will queue behind us that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because we have shared the gospel with them? Who will stand behind you? Will it be perhaps that somebody will be being taken to hell and he will say, hold on a minute, I've got something to plead and he will turn and he will ask to speak to you and tell you, you are my neighbor. You knew the gospel and you never shared it with me. I am going to burn in hell because you never shared it with me. One every day. Remember the lessons that we have learned. It's not our work to convict, but the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Yours is to share the gospel. Do you have a testimony? That's all you need. And the Lord Jesus Christ will do the rest. Hallelujah. How many of us are willing to drop the pot and go out into the city and share the gospel. It is my prayer for you that you will not take this lightly. This is not just another preaching. 
that we are doing this month, it is a matter of life and death. And some of the people who will eternally go to hell could be your closest friends. That when you meet them, you talk about everything else, but you never share what the Lord has done for you. And so, Father, I pray for us that none of us will be guilty of a soul that will go to hell because we have not shared the gospel with them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. A couple of things I want to talk about today. Some celebrations, some information that uh, we are going to share together. And let me start by telling you something that you know. How many of you enjoy reading the Bible? It is a book that you interact with regularly. How many of you know how to read this Bible in your mother tongue? Lift up your hand. Okay. Not all of us. We shall make Kiswahili our mother tongue. Although I know that sometimes it's not even easy to read it in Kiswahili. There is a way that the word of God just gets right inside when you read it in mother tongue, isn't it? There is a way that it gets inside. But did you know that there are many people who desire to read the word of God for themselves? And there is no Bible in their language. Maybe they have not even gone to school. They cannot read English or they cannot read Kiswahili. The closest they have come to interact with the word of God is when somebody has preached in a different language and there was an interpreter that was interpreting the word of God in their language. And they desire and wish if they could read the word for themselves. As believers... And particularly as Kenya Assemblies of God, we are joining other Christians in the nation of Kenya. And we are going to get together to support Bible translation so that the gospel can be interpreted, can be written in languages of all the people that are unreached. And on the 6th of December, the church in Kenya, we will get together to raise finances 